Hi everyone, my name is Katie Puxley, and I'm a librarian here at the library at Mount St. Vincent. All right. Can everybody see my uh, Firefox browser there? You can put your hand up if you can. You should see uh, the library webpage. Fabulous. And if you do want to follow along with the things that I'm doing as we go, please feel free. Um, so you can um, totally try these things on your computer as you're going. All right, so uh, I'm just out of curiosity. We did have another session uh, last week with uh, Sandra. I'm asking lots of questions. Did anybody attend that session? You can put your hand up if you did. Couple? Great. Okay, so I just want to give a, a short introduction for anybody that may not have seen it before, um, just to the library website so that you know where to find the material that you're looking for. So right off at the front, we have this um, search box in the middle right here, um, and it, it's labeled with the Novanet Discovery. So Novanet is all of the university libraries in Nova Scotia. So when you search this box, you're actually searching all of the books and journals from across the province, which is great because if you find anything you need, um, even if it's uh, down at Acadia or across town at Dal or over up at CBU in Cape Breton, you can still order the books in or you can actually take your library card in to one of those universities, um, your ID card is your library card, and check out any of those books there. So um, we really have a... a a real sharing philosophy through all the libraries um, so you, to get you as many materials as possible. The trick is that if you do a search right here, you're going to be searching all sorts of different databases um, as well as all the materials across the province. So sometimes it's a little tricky to try and focus your search and actually find the materials you're looking for. Um, so we've done a couple of things to make that a little easier. If you were looking for actual books, you can drop this drop down here to books and videos, and that'll lead, limit you just to that collection. So I'm just going to take um, an example here. And I can't spell. But that's okay. It'll probably help me out anyway. So I'm just going to do a quick search here to show you some of the materials that you can actually find. So you can see we have a huge number of materials here, um, 11,000, uh, and that's books and videos, uh, DVDs, that's also streaming videos as well. So we have a number of things that we subscribe to, um, just like Netflix, um, that you can watch uh, documentaries and films and all sorts of stuff on. So when you see here, it'll say multiple versions up at the top, and that's because there's multiple different variations of this book here. So. Um, in this case, they were actually published in different years. And you can see where it's actually available at Mount St. Vincent. And then this thing is what we call the call number in the libraries. It's like the address. And you would take that to right to the shelf to look up the book. So for a physical book, you actually take it to the shelf and you can um, pull it off, see what else might be around it. I'll just see if I, we can pull down um, an electronic book here. For instance, here, this one is Psychology and the Law, Canadian Perspective. And if you see this where we have online access, you see all the different links here to the different libraries. Sometimes it'll just have one link, and again, they'll say Novanet. Um, but again, because we're part of Novanet, that's for everybody. Um, so in this case, you would just click on the Mount St. Vincent link here. And then often it'll make you log in. I forgot to log my computer out. Um, but you can just log in either using your Moodle login, so just your ID, 
um, which is your ID, so that's the first letter of your name and then part of your last name, a number maybe. And, or you can use your email, your first name, dot last name at MSVU. So it's really flexible and that login screen will have all that information on it. So then from here, you can actually um, navigate this book. You'll see the various parts of it. You can move through it, um, click on a section to actually read it, or you can expand it and go into, so for instance, psychology and the law. And it'll actually get the book on screen. And normally the books, um, you can actually um, highlight the text. Um, you can read it, you can print it, you can email it to yourself. You can often cite these things, which is really nice. So if you're looking to cite anything from your papers, you can see the citation button up here. And so that'll actually give you the citation you're looking for. So here, APA. But we did have um, one of our students in um, English, if you wanted to cite in MLA. So there's all sorts of different styles there, and you can just find the one that matches whatever you're looking for. So that's just a very brief introduction to how books work. Um, did anybody have any questions about that? Oh, sorry, somebody was looking for my name. That was Katie Puxley, and I'll put that in the box. And I'll give you my email address there, too, right in the chat box. So I'm just going to close out of this and head back over to the Mount homepage, because we're really going to focus on some more of the databases tonight. So when you're back here, you'll find there's lots of different information. And what we try and do is bring it all together in one place, is mostly using this guides A to Z page right here. So what you'll find under here is we've grouped things by subject. And I'm going to go in under the psychology page here. We only have one primary psychology page, but don't be afraid either to look at different materials um, or different topics that might align. For instance, if you happen to be looking at materials from Canada, you might want to look at the Canadian studies and then try and pull out the psychology out of it or try a business database and then pull out the psychology from there. So the database we're going to be looking at primarily tonight is called PsycInfo, and it's the very first one here on the psychology page. And our psychology page is pretty typical of all of our pages. Um, so a librarian is responsible for each of the different subject areas, and they maintain these pages to make sure that the information and in the databases that you're going to find here are um, the most relevant for whatever you're doing. So I don't know if anybody wants to talk or you want to type in the chat box, but can anybody give me just a really brief definition of what a database is? Yeah, Laura says it's a keeper of information, and that is a really good way to look at it. Can we have somebody else typing too? So please feel free to keep typing and I'm going to chat about that with Laura's answer. Um, so I was trying to remind people that a database, because as Laura says, it's just a, a summary of information is what Blaise said. So it, we've got this notion that it's a place where you put information. Um, and if you're not looking in the right place for the information, it makes your life a lot harder. So, for instance, the contacts on your phone is 
is the database as well. It just has to, needs to be a contact, um, a, a, a list of phone numbers and addresses and people in your life. So just by starting in the right place, you're going to get better information. So if you're working on a, um, a topic for one of your business classes um, or something like that, and you're looking for consumer behavior information, Psych Info is a really great place to start because it's going to pull out those behavioral things um, and the psychology of that stuff, which is so informative um, for a lot of um, uh, marketing, research, um, uh, a lot of uh, economics, um, all those different aspects. So we're going to take a good deep dive into the psych info today. So if you've used any of our databases, this might look like other databases that you've seen before from the library. The way you know where you're actually searching is this um, right here at the top where it says psych info. It's because we have a, do a lot of business with a particular company called EBSCO. And you may see that on our website in different places. So all the EBSCO databases kind of look the same, which is nice, because they often work very, uh, in very, very similar ways and have similar layouts. But they each do kind of different things, and they contain different information. Um, so like I said at the beginning, starting in the right database is going to get you um, to save you time because you're not digging through information that's irrelevant. So I'm going to start right here with consumer behavior. And immediately we see all these things pop up that the, li uh, that the computer is offering. Now, if you're like me and you have a hard time spelling, um, or you type too fast, this is really great because it can, you can make sure that your spelling is working. And it can generate ideas, but I don't want you to just change um, your search because the computer suggested something in this list. It doesn't necessarily pop up because there's a lot of material on a particular subject. Um, this is more based on the kinds of things that people are looking for or what they might be searching in the box or that spelling aspect again. So. If you're really interested in consumer behavior, don't pop down here and just grab consumer psychology thinking, oh, maybe that's better. Because behavior and psychology have really different aspects, and you really are doing the choosing for your paper and for your research. You can always, I like to keep a, a notepad or keep notes um, for your assignment and maybe write things down, and then you can come back and search those later. So I'm going to show you right now how to build a search and put in consumer behavior and just hit the search button. So I haven't done anything to this. I'm just letting the database kind of run wild. Um, and so this is actually a really nice example because we have a huge amount of information. So we have 36,000 articles here. And we're going to cut that down really quick. So I'm going to show you some tricks for how to narrow that. Um, we also have a whole bunch of different things. You can see we've got a, a thesis slash dissertation here is our number two. Does anybody know what that is? You can try typing that in the box. It's not something we see all the time. No guesses? OK. So um, you might be familiar with the word thesis, because we often use those when we're writing a paper. Um, but a thesis or a dissertation is the big, big project you write at the end of either your PhD or your master's. So these aren't really, they're, they're academic, and they're written for an academic art audience, and they are research. But they don't have the same standards of um, academic publishing as an academic article does, and they're also often huge. Um, so they can be um, quite large, and it's like reading an actual book. So um, that's one thing that we're seeing. So there's no kind of limits to the kinds of information or the sources we're getting here. The other thing you might notice if you look down at your dates is that this goes back all the way to 1684. 
five. I'm not sure who was doing consumer behavior research then, but apparently there's somebody in this database that goes all the way back there. And then the other problem uh, that's a little harder to show on this page is that it's pulling out materials with the words consumer and the word behavior, but they're not necessarily together. Uh, they may just be two different words in the same paper, which is maybe what's happening down here is in the, 18, the 1685 paper. They may not be talking about consumer behavior as we think about it, but they may be talking about consumers and then have the word behavior somewhere else. So a couple of things we can do. Well, right away we see that there's these subject lines here, and that's where a real person has actually looked at these papers and said, what are the main topics? What are they really talking about? And added these subject terms onto it to help it make, make it a little easier to pull out the information that's the most relevant and on topic. And so we can use that to our advantage just by selecting this select a field option and going down to subjects. So when you click on that and we hit search again, this is going to change our results. And already we see some things have changed in our list. And we've gone from 36,000 results to 28,000. And we are going to, by the way, I should have mentioned at the beginning, this recording is going to be made um, available online as well. Um, so you'll be able to come back and watch it again if you want to. Um, but feel free to take notes or follow along, like I said. So the first thing we did was add that subject. Um, and that limited a lot of things, but apparently that article all the way back to 1685 um, really was on consumer behavior. It was a subject heading. But I still think we maybe want to stick to the more recent stuff. So I'm going to take this slider and just drag it all the way up here. And maybe even uh, to the last, say, um, let's do last 10 years. And it doesn't want to do that for me. I can't make it go to the 8. Ah, right. OK, we're going to settle it there. So um, you may be wondering why it says 2000, uh, 2018. Um, that is unusual, but it may be um, a preprint thing. Um, publishers will do this when they release the early draft. Um, say an article online now that won't actually be officially, quote unquote, officially published in, in paper copy, for instance, until um, January. So they'll put this new date on it so it kind of makes things look a little weird sometimes. So now we have a new number. Again, we have 17,000 results, um, which we're down to like less than half of what we had before pretty quickly just by changing our subject and our dates. So now we know that stuff is on topic, and we know it's current, which is really what we want in our, um, in any research we're using in papers. Because one of the things you want to make sure with your research, and the kinds of research you pick, is that you're showing your professor how good your research skills are. So the better your papers are, the better those research papers, and the better your citations are, they're going to give you better things to build an argument out of, but they also show just by what you found how good a, skills, a skill set you have. So those are one of the things your professors are actually looking for. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is come over here where it says um, peer-reviewed scholarly journals. Does anybody want to take a stab at what peer-reviewed is? Does anybody know what that term means? Okay, so we got a clear no. Um, peer reviewed is a process that's used in publishing academic articles. So, um, I te sometimes tease the professors that I work with that it's a little like being a student forever because the peer review process 
happens when um, a researcher or professor does um, a bunch of research or writes a paper, and then they submit it to a journal to be published before it goes for publication. It's actually reviewed by either the board or the editors at the journal, or they send it out to another researcher who knows a lot about that topic. So in that case, one of their peers, and that's where the peer review term comes in. So when they send it out to another reviewer, that person makes comments, makes changes. It looks a lot like the marking process and then it gets sent back to the original author, who then can make changes. Some of those changes might be suggestions, some of those changes might be required by the journal, um, and then they can hopefully improve their work, um, but also keep it academic, make sure that it's truthful. Um, this is one way to kind of avoid the, like, um, fake research or fake news kind of aspect of research that might happen and slip something in that's not true or fake your research or um, even falsify your results. So that's one of the ways um, that reviewers do those things because they check your math and they check um, the sources that you are using and the way your argument is built. So we're going to click that button and refresh our results. And now we're up to 14,000. So I know that's still a huge amount of material, but considering we started with 36,000 and we've just cut out about 22,000 results, we're not doing too badly. So what this gives us right now is a really nice base to start um, looking at some of the other aspects that you might be interested in. Um, because, you know, all of these items are new, they're on topic, and they're all academic. So what you can do with these other fields that we have here at the top is start adding other aspects that you might be interested in. Does anybody have a suggestion that they might want to try as a second topic in this search? Okay, I don't see anybody rushing to type, so I'm going to go with the old standby of social media. Because there's always research on social media. And so now we're down to 300 results, and we can do the same thing with social media that we did before. Change that to a subject. We're down to 230 results. So you can keep going from here to add other subject terms in. Um, you might uh, uh, other aspects of your article or different things that you were interested in as well. And kind of narrow that down. I like to try to get to about 100 results because you'll find as you get into that smaller numbers that even though 100 sounds like a big amount, if you're looking at a particular aspect, say, um, uh, I don't know, consumer behavior on social media in Canada or um, for a particular group or um, age group or something, that they're still only a little bit maybe on your subject. So um, 100 results may seem like a lot, but you'll also find very quickly you can read a title and decide whether you want it or discard it right away. So I'm going to go just back to my social media search with or, uh, sorry, back to my consumer behavior search and show you some of the other things that we can do. And I'm going to use this search history box here, which is really helpful. This should last about eight hours normally on your own computer. Um, and this will show you all the things that we've done here. And we can also review our steps as well. So here we, at the, for S1, which is our first search, we just searched um, the words consumer behavior without changing anything. Then we looked at it as a subject. The third step we did was limiting our years, and then we made it a peer-reviewed search. And if you get good at this, you can come in on the first screen and do a lot of those things right away. So I'm just going to go back to um, this search here. And 
you'll see that my search history is still open. I'm just going to close that again and show you some of the other things that are really interesting about this database that don't happen in other places. Um, and particularly because it's a psychology database, um, we have some other subjects and headings along the side here. I'm just going to scroll down and apologize um, if that's bothering anybody. This you don't see in some of the others, uh, particularly business databases or the educational databases, because when we're talking about psychology, age and gender makes, are so important, we can actually see these different age ranges are broken out for us right away. So I'm going to click on show more just so you can see all the options. Um, and they get very, very detailed here. And you can see this um, actually tells us how many articles are in each category here. So um, at the beginning, you'll remember when we were typing in that box and it was popping up different suggestions, I said, don't um, necessarily take what the computer suggests, but in this case, we can actually see the number of articles related to each um, different category by age. Um, so this is fascinating. We have um, neonatal or uh, from birth to one month. There's actually 23 articles here um, on what consumer behavior is. Um, probably relates to their parents, I would suspect, but you could go in and see what that is. And then all of these different age groups. Um, and this is really helpful. So since we were doing social media, I'm actually going to um, pull out the young adults. And this is the 18 to 29 category, which probably most of us are in. So let's just see what that does. And we have 4,000 articles. That's down from our um, 14,000. And now if we put in social media, oh, that's interesting. I can't spell uh, social. So definitely you don't get anything if you can't spell. So here we're back to, um, do we lose our age? I think we may have lost our age category. I'm going to take that 100 young adults. And there we go. So where I was said I was really trying to aim for that about 100 mark down to the double digits, this would be where I would start actually checking these articles to see what was the most relevant to what was going on. Um, and very quickly, you'll see that there's so many different aspects of consumer behavior and social media in this age range, but not all of them apply to what you're looking at. So to find out a little bit more about each of these articles, you can actually click on the article itself on the title, and it will give you much more information. So we can see um, various keywords. We can also find out more um, about um, who the authors are, what their affiliations are. So if you have any questions about um, whether an article is reputable, and often professors will um, say that they really want to make sure that you have um, uh, academic information, these kind of things, this is one of the ways you check whether things are actually um, valid. You can see the credentials there from your authors. And then the abstract is really going to help you. Um, and if you learn to read abstracts, it'll also cut down on the amount of time you need to read articles, because this gives you in a short paragraph just what the article is doing. So for instance, we can see um, uh, participants in the study as they relate to their complaints on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, and maybe you only want things that relate to one of these or um, that's not the kind of social media you're interested in or uh, maybe you're not interested in complaints. This very quickly will tell you whether you want to include this or um, remove it from your study or from your research. So let's say we wanted to actually read this article. Um, the linked full text is actually right here, so you're always looking for that linked text, um, full text. Sometimes it'll say PDF, and that should pop you right out to the article. 
so that you can read it on screen. And so here where I was saying that you want to look for PDF, uh, it doesn't always say full text. You can see the, you can actually download the actual paper right here. They've also made the paper um, as user-friendly as possible for reading on screen um, with all the hyperlinks to all the other um, uh, references that are also in this database, which is really nice because if you're trying to do research, um, this is a way of, sometimes we call it following the breadcrumbs, um, but you can link back to the other things that um, these researchers have looked at because they went through the same process that you're going through right now to find other research material and you can follow back that thread that they built up and use those in your paper as well. So some of the other tools that we can see here, we had the um, uh, download, you can export it, um, so you can save it right to RefWorks. I don't know if any of you have RefWorks accounts, but I highly recommend them. Um, and if there's any time at the end, I can touch on RefWorks, which is our citation manager, and it'll help you organize your text, and it actually has a plug-in for Word, and it will cite your papers um, and create your bibliography right inside Word as you're going, so that's a really nice feature. So I'm just going to close this one out and pop back over to the other page. Um, the other thing that you'll see is if you don't get this linked full text or if you don't see PDF full text, we have this check for full text button and that's super important. And what that does, you can see the mount logo right here in the top corner. What this has actually done is taken that information about your article and searched it all the way through Mount St. Vincent's library for you. And to see if we do actually have this article anywhere, either in print or from any different publisher. And this will actually take us back to the, the linked full text we saw earlier, but it will give you a list of anywhere um, that it might be. And then if for any reason it doesn't happen to pop up, you can use this document delivery um, request here. And I'll just click on that just to show you what the login looks like. And I should have a login in front of me from Monty Montana. Let's see. Should be right. So what it actually is, is if you pull out your student ID card, you'll see there's a big, long number that looks kind of like this um, in the middle of your card. That's your barcode, and that's what you need to log in here. This is one of the only places you'll use it. Um, and then your password is normally the last four digits of your phone number. And if I type that correctly, it should take me in. And then it'll fill out this whole form for you. All you have to do is scroll down to the bottom. Just check this box here, and then it will let you actually submit it. I'm not going to because obviously Monty Montana doesn't need this article. We do have it through the Mount Library. But that just gives you an idea of how to do that. It's a very easy process. It's connected quite seamlessly. Um, and we do ask for like, five days normally to get an article to you, but we actually average uh, about a day and a half, two days. Um, it's actually a really fast turnaround time, and we email the article right to your inbox, so it comes right to you, you, um, and it can be really fast, so um, it's a nice way to get articles, even if we might not happen to have what you're looking for. Like I said at the beginning, all those libraries trying to do their most to share the material and make it as accessible as possible. Any questions about that before I close that out? Okay. 
you may have figured out I'm using the time to drink my water bottle in the middle while we're answering questions. So I'll just close this back over to uh, Psych Info. And I'll show you a couple of the other features that we do here on the side. So this does actually link it to Google Drive as well. So if you're writing your papers through Google Drive, that's another option. Um, you can certainly email it to yourself. Or if you're working on a group project, this is another nice feature. Um, what I don't recommend is just putting in research or the class name. Um, if you're going to start emailing a whole bunch of stuff to yourself, try and make them somewhat unique. Either copy the title here, um, use your course code, try and break it up. Otherwise, you'll have a whole pile of emails to yourself that all have the same name, which does not help for finding anything later. Um, you can save the article. You can cite it. This is a really nice feature that a lot of our databases have. Um, and I showed you this with your, the ebooks earlier. Um, there's often more options, but you can actually copy this right out and put it straight into a paper. And then you can export this. And again, it will default to RecWorks, which is our, uh, a citation manager that we subscribe to on your behalf. Um, so it is a paid service, but it is one that is already paid for for you by virtue of being a Mount student. So it's a really, really nice feature. Um, all right. So those are the big things about how to actually work with the articles. And I'm going to go back to my results list for a second just to show you some of the other features um, down the side. So if I wanted to pull this back, I can easily take off those years for young adults, and I'm going to put on gender. And gender, of course, is very similar. Um, but you can see that um, there aren't a lot of articles here for male or female. Gender only gets tagged, really, if it's um, something that they're um, using as a focus of the article. Um, sometimes you will see um, male and female tagged, for, so it's more of a universal thing. But if it's not something um, that's of key importance to an article, then they're not going to flag it either. So if you do decide to take a group, say let's say you wanted to look at um, uh, social media um, uh, effect on the spending habits of, say, teen girls, then you might have to look at some papers that don't just focus on teen girls. And if I can explain that for a second, sometimes the research won't focus all the way down onto just what the gender is. So you'll have to make some more generic um, or so use some broader research to say this is what happens in all teens and pair that with some research that says this is specifically what happens in girls. And what you're actually doing there that's different than what anybody else has done before, and sometimes that's the trick that, that we all have trouble with, is like, what exactly am I doing that's, that's new or different? You're bringing pieces of research together for the first time in that way. So in an assignment for any of your classes, you're not really being asked to go out and do research or find something new, but you are being asked to understand um, to read, to critique how other people have done those things, and then bring those together in a new way. And that ability to bring research together in a new way, or to comment on it or critique it, is what eventually you're going to do when you do your own original research, if you decide to go that route. And what your professors are really looking for, that critical thinking um, and, um, you know, critical research skills to be able to find good material to then really engage with in a deep way. And that's going to get you a much higher mark as well. So some of those are really the, the scores and the highlights uh, for psych info and finding psychological information. 
Did anybody have any questions about any of that or um, a search they might like to see or a topic they might have tried themselves that they wanted? To I saw some flashing chat boxes, but nothing popping up. So that's about it for me for this evening. I hope you found this useful. Oh, actually, we just, I'm doing research on marijuana legislation. Would it be there? You might actually find some stuff in the, the psychology databases on marijuana legislation that's entirely possible. Um, uh, certainly because it's used for um, uh, treating um, mental illness and anxiety and things like that, you're definitely going to see um, those kind of things. So let's do just a quick search. And I'm copying this right out of the checkbox, so I hope you can spell marijuana because I'm not going to attempt it. Oh, and actually, so it came up with uh, 228 items, uh, but actually what you can see on the side here is that we still have all of those search um, uh, limits that I had put on earlier. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to clear my search and start right over and let's see just how much is in this database. 492. So. Um, this is a really good way to kind of test the waters um, by not using any search parameters at the beginning to see whether there's a lot in the database or not. Um, and so that can be really helpful. For instance, when we did consumer behavior, we got 36,000 results. It gives you a good idea of what, um, how much is in here. But it actually is a subject term. Um, and you can see marijuana usage. And then it does have great age categories here, so that might be useful as well. Um, uh, so you can actually see that this is a nice one here for number three, the impact of marijuana legislation on adolescent use, for instance, um, consequences and perceived risk. This is a great one if you want to really focus in on a particular um, age group. I just see people have to leave because of class. Thank you for coming, and I really appreciate you being here. And um, just before anybody else goes, I'm going to take a screenshot. I just for the Learning Passport students need to be able to see who is here this evening. So I'm just going to pause for one second, if you'll indulge me, and make sure I get that screenshot. Thanks, guys. I just want to make sure that you get your Learning Passport credits for anybody that's coming along. So this marijuana legislation could be a really good one to um, uh, use with that kind of age category. So even though there's not a lot in this database, it's a really nice place. Um, for instance, um, on adolescence, um, you've already got 80 articles here. Um, so it's really focusing it down in a way that you might not be able to in some of those other databases. And then you could do the same thing with gender if you were interested in that as well. Any other questions that, or any other topics people have been challenged by lately? Great, no problem. Sorry, there was a thank you there. All right, um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to stop in. I'm just going to close, uh, stop sharing this window now. And that'll take a minute to refresh, but I will, um, once my application has stopped sharing, I will put my, um, here we go, I'm going to just put my email address and things back up on this, um, uh, on the whiteboard for you. Maybe it's still thinking pretty hard. There we go, let's see if this will work now. And there it is. So 
so as I said, I'm, uh, my name is Katie Puxley, and I'm one of the librarians here at the Mount. Um, and it's, uh, it's frozen again, but uh, my email address is just katie.puxley at msvu.ca. Um, feel free to drop in and see any of us, and definitely by 8 o'clock I'll have all those forms ready for anybody that wants to drop in and get their learning passports signed. Oh, great. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, please do drop in the library. I'm in most days. I'm in it. Um, I'm generally in at eight o'clock, but then Tuesday nights are my late night, and I'm am in uh, right until nine o'clock on Tuesdays. So please feel free, anybody, to drop in anytime. And thanks for coming.